understand everything in the oral Torah, in the Torah Shebi al -Pay. I don't. I don't understand everything in there. There's some weird stuff. Okay, what is the oral Torah? Let me give you an example. Gomorrah plus, um, Gomorrah plus Mishnah equals Talmud. Write it down. Talmud equals oral law. Torah should be out there. Talmud equals uh, Gemara, the G Mishnah plus the Gemara. The Mishnah is a commentary on the Torah, and the Gemara is a commentary on the Mishnah. Let me give you an example. And then, of course, we have more Rambam, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, Maimonides, who has his own Mishnah Torah. Okay. So, let me give you an example of what's written in the, in the uh, Torah Shebel Peh. In the Torah Shebel Peh, Rabbi Eliezer says, Hashim took us out of Mitzrayim by an outstretched arm. One rabbi says, aha, five fingers, ten plagues, two plagues per finger. The other rabbi says, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're talking about. Hashim took us out with ten plagues, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Hand is five fingers, but an arm is... Ten fingers because we have two arms. So one rabbi says, Yahweh used ten fingers when he took us out of Egypt. The other rabbi says, you're an idiot. He only used an arm. Come on. Uh, he used five fingers. A third rabbi comes along and says, you're both a Mishnah cup. You're both crazy. He says, he, he says, with the finger of Yahweh, he delivered Israel. With his finger. With his mind. If he used his mind, he didn't use any hands, and he didn't use any fingers. And this is recorded in the Mishnah. A, Rabbi A says this, Rabbi B says this, and Rabbi C says, you both are plunged in the head. And all these rabbinic discussions and all these rabbinic arguments are recorded in the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Torah Shebel Peh cannot be the word of Yahweh, should not have any place in your congregation, except like the encyclopedia. If you want to verify, or you want to uh, study, you can use the Talmud, but only like you would use the Yellow Pages. Or only like you would use the, the, the dictionary, but not for theology or doctrine. Amen? So let me see, if Rabbi Eliezer says turn left, Rabbi Eliezer says turn right, Rabbi, the, the, the third Rabbi uh, Azariah says go up, and they're all the Torah, meaning when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he had all three rabbinic opinions. And all three contradict each other, but they're all the word of Yahweh. How can that be? How can all three opinions contradict Yahweh and the Bible, and all three be from Yahweh? If I said that Carlos's shirt was black, somebody else said Carlos's shirt was red, somebody else said Carlos's shirt was yellow, all three are correct, and not only all three are correct, Moses knew that Carlos's shirt would be black, red, and yellow. In that little brain of Moses, he knew all these things coming down. And the way the Talmud is set up is, and the Torah should be out there, it's an ongoing, growing body of, of, of jurisprudence. Therefore, if a rabbi in Brooklyn in 2006 says, aha, uh -huh, this is what Exodus 4.4 4 means. This is what Exodus 5.5 5 means. And he writes his opinion, and it's approved by the community at large. That opinion is not only as valid as the other opinions already written in the Gomorrah and the Mishnah. Moses knew it. So if, if, if our friend Moshe here comes up with a revelation, and the Orthodox community approves the revelation by some chance, right? They wouldn't because they wouldn't have anything to do with you. But by some chance, right? You, guess what? You're in love. Moses knew it. When he came down, well, it took, took 3,000, over 3,500 years to be revealed to mankind through our friend in Houston. Doesn't matter. Moses knew it. You see what I'm saying? That's how, that's how crazy this thing gets. Nazarene Israelites say no. 
Not at all. The Torah Shebi'al Peh in the Talmud is rejected as divine revelation but can be respected as a great historical work of man's wisdom that can add insight and understanding to scripture. For instance, let me give an example, just one example. I have many such examples. I don't have it written down, I have it in my head. In the Midrash on Zechariah 9.9, what does Zechariah 9.9 say? Rejoice, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, riding, riding upon an ass, the colt, the fowl of an ass, meek, having salvation, right? So the rabbis said, one rabbi said this. The rabbi said, you know what that means? That means that if Israel is worthy of their Mashiach, he will come on the clouds of heaven, Daniel 7, 20, 21, to the ancient of days. But if Israel or the Jewish people are not worthy of their Mashiach, he'll be sent to us on a donkey. Mm -hmm. Think about that. But were we worthy of our Messiah? No. He came on a donkey. That was some pretty heavy insight. That was some pretty interesting stuff. I'll give you another example of good things in the Talmud. The Talmud says, in the beginning, Yah Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That means, say the rabbis, that the spirit of the eternal Messiah King, son of David, covered the waters upon the earth. Huh? Don't we believe Yeshua is eternal? Don't we believe Yeshua is the eternal Messiah? The rabbis recognize the Messiah is eternal. That's written in the Talmud. You read some things in the Talmud and you say, oh my goodness, how could they miss it? How, how is it even possible that they miss these things? You follow me? You're not doing translation? No, taking a rest? Yeah? No, I'm not giving you a hard time. I'm just asking you. Okay. You guys okay? Everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay. Um, so, yes, the, 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 the Talmud's got some amazing, amazing things. Um, for instance, in the Talmud it says, uh, the suffering Messiah will be Ben Yosef, like Yosef he will suffer, but also says the Messiah, son of Ephraim, um, as it is written, he has carried our diseases and carried our afflictions. Messiah, son of Ephraim. Why is the Messiah called a child of Ephraim? Because it says he will gather the ten tribes and bring them back home to Israel. It says it right there in the Talmud. Messiah is called Ephraim, my son. What do you mean Ephraim, my son? He will bring back my son Ephraim. The suffering of the Messiah will bring back Ephraim, my son. All these things are in the Talmud. So there's amazing things in there, but we cannot bring it into our congregation as thus saith Yahweh. You follow me? We cannot do that. Don't ever be tempted or pressured into doing that. Issue number six, the Shema. Shema, right? Israel, right? Yahweh. Traditional Jews say they profess the Shema as a bedrock of Jewish faith. They insist that the, their view is the Shema that proves that Yahweh is an absolute unity and not a trinity or a compound unity or a plurality of divinity. Nazarene Israelites say this, we also profess the Shema as a pillar of our faith. However, the word Echad in the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, was written by Moshe Rabbeinu with the intention of teaching the true compound nature of Yahweh. So, how many know the Shema by heart? How many know it by heart? Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Or does it go to Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Yachid? No. Yachid is an absolute unity. Echad is a compound unity. So we believe in the Shema, like Jews believe in the Shema, but they insist it's Yahid, and Moses used the wrong word. We insist Moses used the right word, Echad. Yeah. A compound plurality of unity and divinity. So we both confess the Shema, but we see it written correctly. Their understanding would contradict the way Moshe wrote it. Issue number seven, the Torah. 
Traditional Jews say that the Torah is the primary focus of their life. They try to fulfill the Torah through personal striving, fulfillment, and good deeds. Nazarene Israelites say, on the other hand, the Torah is the instruction manual for the redeemed community of Yahweh. Torah observance is a byproduct of a spirit-filled and directed life. All attempts to perform Torah outside the born-again experience is doomed to failure. Follow me? So we, along with tra traditional Judaism, see the Torah as a, our, our life. We see that this Torah is our life. But we are to see the Torah, and I want you to be very careful here because you've got to be careful. We see the Torah as the guide by which we walk in the Holy Spirit, by which we walk in the Ruach HaKodesh. So that if we're, Galatians says, be filled with the Ruach HaKodesh. Right? And then it tells us the fruit of the Ruach HaKodesh, love, peace, love, suffering, meekness, and so on. But it doesn't tell us how. So the Torah is our guidebook. We are to use it. When you go back to your congregations, you say, we don't trust in the Torah for eternal life. We, we, we rely on the Torah as the redeemed community of Yahweh, so we don't walk in the flesh and we walk in the spirit. So the Torah keeps us walking in the spirit. But it's only a guidebook for the redeemed community of Yahweh. It cannot lead to salvation, and those who use the Torah unlawfully do not attain salvation as traditional Judaism does. I want to warn you, be very careful in your congregations, very careful about dual covenant theology. I cannot warn you enough. That's the Jews don't need Yeshua. They get into heaven without Yeshua by keeping Torah. No, 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 no. Big, big, big major error we are to be very, very careful about. So we say we need the born-again experience to have a desire to do Torah. The Jews have to do Torah to get to heaven. We get to do Torah because we're born again. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. You don't have to do Torah. We get the privilege of doing Torah. And that's what it means to do Torah in the spirit. You follow me? We have that privilege. Do I have to? No, absolutely not. There's not a person in this world that can force me to do Torah, and I'll probably still go to heaven. But I won't have abundant life. I'll have a struggling life, confused and swayed with every wind of doctrine. Amen? Okay. Number eight, Ephraimites, the ten tribes, non-Jewish Israelites. Traditional Jews, by and large, believe that all non-Jews are basically pagans or unclean Gentiles. In other words, Having grown up in a Jewish home, and also my Rebbitzin Rebbe, having grown up in a Jewish home. Um, and by the way, notice we call each other Rebbitzin and Rabbi. Not that we're into titles, but <laughs> especially being in a home group, okay? Your people need to call you Rabbi or Shepherd or Spiritual Leader. Because you're, you're cheating yourself of the, of, the, of the order of decency and the orders of the congregation of Yahweh. Not that you're to seek titles. So when, you, when your elders speak to you and your people speak to you, have them address you with respect. Because if not, then what's going to happen is a little ch child comes to you in the congregation and goes, Yo, Carlos, what's happening, man? Now, that's okay for an adult. But it, why, if the adults don't call you rabbi or, or shepherd or elder, whatever you're, you're, you want to be, you know, whatever is cool, then you're going to have little kids going up to you. And going, hey, Carlos, hi, baby, what's happening? That's disrespectful. That's very disrespectful. We don't go to our mother and father and go, hi, darling. So why should we allow it in our congregation? I was told a long time ago, make sure your people respect you. And, 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 and I had a guy say that. Make sure they call you pastor. Not that I'm looking for the title or he was looking for the title. He said the people need that. They need to know there are healthy boundaries of demarcation. Do you understand what I'm saying? The people need it. Not just you, the people. Now, of course, we're all brothers, that's true. But I mean, what, what really got me back to, for a while I was going with Brother Moshe, because I felt it was more humble and so forth. But it got me right, it snapped me right back to reality because I realized, what about the kids? 
But I want 10-year-old kids calling me, yo, Mo, what's happening? I don't want that. I don't want that. So I got, I got away from that. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. When Yeshua said, call no man rabbi, father, or, uh, or teacher, he was saying, you don't do the calling, I do. Don't, don't distribute titles like you're distributing coffee. I'll distribute titles and I'll decide who's who. You're all brothers. Until you're called, you're all brothers. But he couldn't be what most people claim it to be because they call no man father. Then John turns around and, in 1 John 2.15 and says, I write to you fathers because you've known him from the beginning. He calls mature believers fathers. So Yeshua couldn't have meant to call no man father. He was saying, I do the calling, and until then, you're all Israelite brothers. You call no man, because I do the calling. That's what he meant. I almost got into error with that, but I, Yahweh snapped me back. Nazarene, you Israelites, say no, no. Ephraimites, talking about Ephraimites. Um, in the Jewish mentality, you have to understand this, when you witness the Jewish people and you share with Jewish people, in the Jewish men mentality, there are, there is us and them, okay? I don't care if you're Christians, Muslims, Nazis, Buddhists, Shintoists, it doesn't matter. When you're talking to a Jew, it's us versus them. If you're not one of us, you're one of them. It doesn't matter who the them are. Everybody's put into a big pot called Goyim. Even the ten tribes, the ten tribes of non-Jewish Israel, Ephraim. So when you're speaking to an average Jewish person who doesn't know their Talmud, they don't know their Bible, because even the Talmud teaches that the ten tribes became the fullness of the Gentiles. The Talmud says, be careful when you marry a Gentile girl and treat her with respect in accordance with the Torah, because you may be marrying an Ephraimite from the ten tribes and not even know it. So the Talmud, the rabbis knew about Ephraim. The rabbis knew about Ephraim. But Jews today don't know about it for you. And if you're not us, you're them. Make sense? We say no. Nazarene Israelites say human beings fall into these groups. Uh, you can look at it this way. Unsaved? No, let me change that. Human beings fall into two groups. Saved? Lost. Yisrael, the nations. So we see the world, we see Islam and unsaved Jews and unregenerate Catholics all in the same way. They're the saved or lost. The saved are called the commonwealth of Yisrael. Those who are not saved are in the nations. Isn't that a lot simpler? You know how a Hebrew tells time? This world and the world to come. Not the age of dispensation, the age of grace, the age of the rapture, the age of choice, the age of the future, the age of this, this age ends this, this age, and we call John Hagee and say, please, Brother John, bring out the charts so I can understand. When does the age of diluvian, post-diluvian, pre-diluvian, anti -diluvian? Listen, you don't even know what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning. Many of you can't even remember your social security number. And you're going to tell God or Yahweh, when one age begins and the other age ends. It's so simple, we make it so complicated. Here's how to tell time according to history. Ready? Olam hazeh, olam haba. This world, next world. You wanna inherit the next world? Get saved and righteous in this world. Can it get any easier? What's the kingdom of Yahweh? The millennial, the post-millennial, pre-millennial, post-millennial, and the millennial's not really eternity. Eternity is tacked onto the millennial. But if you take the millennial and you, t and, you, and you put it together with eternity, you'll get eternity, but it's not really eternity until the new Jerusalem comes down. But it's not really the new Jerusalem comes down because the heavens got to come down to the earth and the earth got to go up to the heavens. So do the meek inherit the earth? Or do the meek inherit the skies? Do the meek inherit, do we live forever in heaven? Do we live forever on the earth? Sound familiar? The Jews are rejected until the rapture. At the rapture, the Jews are chosen, but they're not fully chosen. There's 144,000, and then the age of the 144,000 comes to an end, and then becomes the age of this, and then... Oh, come on. Please, don't insult me or Yahweh's word. Please. Let's make this simple. You say it, you're born again, you're forgiven. Good. You're going to inherit the age to come. You're in. Now, then. Now, then, 
Olam hazeh, olam haba. That's it. A little bit easier. So remember how it is a Hebrew sea time. If we do this thing right with Yahweh and his blood and his forgiveness, where are we going to wind up? Back in Ghana, Eden, back in the Garden of Eden. Right? Right? This is the Hebraic concept of time. Right? But the, the, the Gentile or the unregenerated, it's like time is linear. All right. So we see the world in two groups. Israel and the nations. That's all. I don't have to worry about who the church is, who the real church, the saved church, blah, blah, blah. No, no. Israel, born again, loving Torah, and the nations. Next, two Mashiach theory. Two Mashiach theory. Traditional Jews say, most conservative and orthodox, that the word of Yahweh teaches two separate messiahs. Two separate Mashiachs. One who will suffer as Mashiach ben Yosef, the son of Joseph, like Joseph suffered, and the other, the eternal reigning Messiah, son of David, Mashiach ben David, who will rule and reign like David. Reformed Judaism rejects all concepts of a literal Mashiach or personal Mashiach. And Reformed Judaism instead adopts the hope <laughs> of a messianic age. Okay? So, so the uh, two Messiah theory goes like this. The first Messiah will come to suffer. The second Messiah will come to be a king. You've heard of that, right? Two Mashiach theory. Why, why do they accept the two Mashiach theory? Because there are scriptures, some of the scriptures appear uh, appear to say that the Messiah will suffer. Then the next verse says he'll live forever. Well, how can he live forever when he's dead? Right? Verse 6 says he will die and suffer for the sins of man. The next verse says, but Mashiach reigns and lives forever. So the rabbis didn't know what to do. They go, okay, the two Messiahs. One like Joseph suffers, one reigns like David. Not true. Nazarene Israelites say Mashiach is only one person, never two. Yeshua is the Mashiach. He has come to suffer and fulfill one set of prophecies, the, the suffering servant prophecies, um, Messianic scriptures, over 300, his first coming, and will return to rule the world from Yerushalayim as the son of David, as the reigning Messiah, we thus rejecting the two messiahs as fallacious. What's another way to say fallacious? Unbiblical. One messiah, two comings, not two messiahs. One messiah, two comings, not two messiahs. That's how we reconcile the scriptures. One messiah, two missions. One to redeem, one to reign. With the redeemed. You can't reign unless you choose.